If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. Oh boy, guess what? What's that? It's Mind Pump time. So it is. This episode, we talk all about fitness, but before we do that, we do our introductory fun time conversation that lasted about 50 minutes. Here's what we talked about. So in the beginning of the episode, we start out by talking about the simulator of human intestinal microbial ecosystem. Basically the, a poop machine. This is a, a machine at the Seed Company, Seed being uh, one of the industry leaders in probiotics, that simulates the digestive system of the body, and it shows them that their, their product, their probiotic, makes it to the small intestines. That's what makes them... Uh, one of the best companies out there for probiotics. Now, we are sponsored by Seed. If you go to seed.com forward slash mind pump and use the code mind pump, you'll get 20% off your first month supply of the daily symbiotic. Then we talked about how 50 to 90% of computer users have digital eye strain. This is characterized by uh, dry eyes, neck pain, headaches. I didn't know it was that much, so we kind of tripped over that. But we did talk about how you can use blue blocking glasses to help prevent some of those symptoms. One of our favorite companies for blue blocking glasses is Felix Gray. They make blue blockers for day and night use. If you go to Felix Gray Glasses, Gray spelled G-R-A-Y, glasses.com forward slash mind pump, you'll get free shipping and free returns. Then we talked about video game addiction and how it's an official mental health disorder uh, named by the World Health Organization. It's a real thing. We talked about UFOs and how Navy pilots are reporting them like crazy. We talked about the controversy uh, or the, the purported controversy. We probably we think it might be fake uh, coming out about Martin Luther King Jr. We talked about Hungary's, fake. Hungary's new tax policy. Uh, apparently, if you have a lot of kids there, you don't pay any income taxes. And then Justin brought up Mount Everest and how it's getting crowded up there but not with live bodies. No. Uh, then we get into the fitness portion of this episode. The first question, can you speed up your metabolism by eating more calories and not doing anything else? In other words, if I'm not lifting weights to speed up my metabolism, I'm just doing lots of cardio, but I also bump my calories, is that going to positively influence my metabolism? The next question, how do you train your ability to recover and increase your work capacity? Is there a way to work out so that you get faster recovery, and so that you can work out more. The next question, what are the essentials that we consider you should get if you have a home gym? And the final question, is lifting heavy weights a bad idea right after a really deep tissue massage? Also, there's one day left, 24 hours left for the 50% off sale on MAPS HIT. Remember, HIT stands for High Intensity Interval Training. This is our fitness program that is designed to burn maximum amount of body fat in a short period of time. It's programmed expertly with barbell complexes, dumbbell complexes, and body weight type movements. And there's three levels for beginners, intermediate, and advanced. This program is uh, phenomenal, and it's also 50% off, but only for the next 24 hours. After that, it goes back up to regular price. Here's what you do. Go to MAPS HIT, that's M-A-P-S-H-I-I-T dot com, and use the code Hit 50, H-I-I-T, 5-0 for the discount. Act now before the sale is over. Do it. Are you looking for some fitness? Oh, shit. Are you looking to get lean, girl? Oh, shit. Is your body full of fatness? Damn. <laughs> Relax, I'm not being mean, no, no. Maybe it's time to get in shape. Maybe it's time to get off your sweet ass. <laughs> Sign up for a fitness program. Yeah. That's all by itself another class. Maps Fitness, baby, yeah. <laughs> oh, bro. Oh, cut me off. You're straight fire, dog. Bro. Damn, son. Wow. I'm trying to lay down some tracks. Dude, wow. I, I saw Adam's panties were coming down. Oh, dude. <laughs> <laughs> <His legs. laughs> yeah. we're, I'm working on my smoothness. That was so good. Bro. Hey, thanks, man. That was so good. Yeah, it was. I mean, Sal wrote the lyrics. I can't take credit it's true. for that. So. It's true. Yeah. I, mean, I wrote yeah. the lyrics. He's, I, he's yeah, the doc, talent. Dr. Dre here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> 
<laughs> throwing their beats, putting their beats oh, together. Shit, bro. I was, <laughs> this morning when Justin, because we got that auto tune app or whatever, yeah. and uh, Justin, you know, we were, you were doing your interview, so Justin and I were out there. And I'm like, dude, let's, let's do a song. Let's write a sweet, let's, sweet jam right now. Let's write a song, yeah. bro. Yeah. That's out, what so. came out. Dr. Dre and Mac Cheese. I Watch was, out, <laughs> Mac Cheese. <laughs> Mac Cheesy. <laughs> Mac Cheesy. Well, cheesy. Mac Cheese up in the house. Uh, <laughs> so good. Damn. It was a good time. Yeah. Bro, I'm see now I'm nervous you're gonna get picked up from us. You, you know, know, it's just gonna be me and Sal. I mean, that was just, you know, just right off the cuff. Like imagine, you know, if I had time. <laughs> yeah. Imagine if you had right. like, a, like yeah. a real studio. It was just like, yeah, I'd lay it down all day. That's how he that's <laughs> he goes home to his wife. He's like, Hey baby, I gotta play something for you. I gotta play something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's up, baby? Anyway. Hey there, girl. Anyway, it was so it was so good. <laughs> Dude, so uh I wanted to tell you guys that I did not know this. Remember when we interviewed the CEO of Seed and he talked about how they test their probiotic and it's one of the only probiotics that actually reaches where it's supposed to go because most of them get destroyed by the stomach. I didn't know I didn't know that. Yes. I remember when he did say that though. Well, think about it. Like if you have um, a lot of these probiotics need to be refrigerated. And he made the point, he's like, if it doesn't if it can't live <laughs> in your bedroom outside of the fridge, it ain't, ain't going to survive. In your stomach. Yeah. yeah, it ain't going to survive that whole process. But theirs apparently um, apparently does. And what they have is they have this huge machine. Because, you know, I told you guys that they're like the leaders in research. Right. They have like mm-hmm. some of the top researchers of the world on microbiome science. Well, they have this big machine that they call, um, I don't know if it's pronounced Shime or Shimmy, but it stands for a simulator of the human intestinal microbial ecosystem. So it's this big simulation machine that they'll put their probiotic through. It's and they act like your gut? Yeah, it acts like your gut. Oh, wow. And they found that over 90 to 94% of their probiotic uh, was released in the small intestines, which is where, it's, where they want it to go. And the way they do this is they have this like this probiotic inner capsule and outer capsule that – protects it through the pro- digestive process and di- delivers it where it needs to go. But how cool is that? They have this big machine that they'll drop a, a, a probiotic in there and see uh-huh. where it actually you know, ends up, which I think is really cool. So the machine's like a, like an artificial like whole digestive like process? Yeah, yes. And I don't know what Crazy. it looks like. Yeah, what's that look like? Yeah. yeah, and is it poop? <laughs> you know yeah, they put, to, right? they put stuff in the it hole. and then it comes out the end and is it I would imagine so. It's an artificial poop machine. I yeah. still I'm still getting tagged on shares from that episode. Oh yeah, that, that episode is yeah, so no. fire. No, speaking of speaking of poop, yeah, uh, <laughs> poop machines. Poop did your machines. Did, oh you didn't have a sister uh Justin, but no. Adam, did your younger sisters ever get the baby alive dolls? Do you remember those? No. My sister was a fanatic for dolls, and so when Baby Alive came out, she like lost her mind. That's what she wanted. Oh, this is all I want. Oh, I that, just want that. That's the one that actually peed and pooped. Yeah, you yeah. feed it. I remember and, that. And it would take a shit in the diaper. Yeah. What? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it would turn into what? shit. What? Yeah, and then and she'd be all excited. Oh, my baby pooped. Yay, let's clean it. Yeah, I don't get like people talk about the differences between boys and girls. Boy, let me tell you, little boys don't typically want more responsibilities as part of their plan. <laughs> yeah, like, you know what I mean? Excited about yeah, I don't know what's exciting about that. I don't know, you know? either. Yeah, I, wanna, I want to baby that poops. So, you, know, you don't. <laughs> you actually don't want to have Chucky. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's Tra- much better. Speaking of which, uh, Child's Play is coming out again. Is it? Yes. No way. I, I was is it at, a remake, a prequel? What is it supposed to be? I, that's don't, funny. I don't know if it's a remake, <laughs> but it's it's just called Child's Play. Mm-hmm. So it's there's no like part two, part four, whatever. I was at the movies with my uh, son. We watched uh, John Wick 3. Yep. I watched that last night. You watched John Wick 3? Yeah, I watched it. Yeah. Tell me that wasn't the most ridiculous. It was so, like, it was funny. It was, like, amusing. Like, the other two actually had a little bit of plot. This one had no plot. It was, like, all just killing and like slashing yeah. and John Wick kills John everyone. John Wick <laughs> just destroys the world. Fucks <laughs> everyone up. Dude, the fight With scenes ninjas. are great. The fight scenes it 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 harkens back to 1990s action movies. Yeah, that's why I like it so much. Uh, I mean, it was definitely entertaining, but it was like so. Like some of the when he's dialogue the guy was with so plate. bad. Yeah, I was just laughing. We, we were having fun. People actually in the theater were like joking and laughing with it. That's you know? what we were doing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, my son and I were cracking up. But anyway, they showed a trailer for Child's Play, 
with Chucky and everything. And I'm like, <clears throat> like in the beginning, it's kind of, you can't tell it's child's play. Yeah. But then I started to figure it out because you hear the, hey, you know, the laugh and then you see the little character and you're like, oh, fuck. Oh, here he comes. Here we go. You can't tell if it's a remake or it's supposed to be what it's supposed to be? I couldn't tell by the trailer. And because they just called it child's play, I don't mm. know. Well, but, that's interesting. I mean, I could see because they brought back it, right? So yes. maybe they're going to go through all these old like horror movies there's a part pop there's right a part now. two to it coming out is there really yeah there's another uh, part uh, of it i never watched the first they should do pet cemetery that was yeah. that was creepy i never watched the original it and i never watched the remake did mm. you watch either one i watched the original <clears throat> yeah is it good oh i mean it's it's kind of cheesy now watching the new mm. one but yeah it still holds up really? somewhat yeah i want to i want to check it out yeah anyway <laughs> you were what were you talking about some statistics about uh Eye strain? Oh, because I got my... So I am I just ordered the new... I got another pair of Felix Grace Human. I'm getting a little ridiculous with these. But they came out with this new uh, stylish pair that are... They're Kelvins, and they're all clear. Mm. So I wanted something a little more stylish than the, the Nashes that I wear right now, which I like a lot. I really like them, but this is something that I can wear with... I, I, you know what? I found the stats, though. The, the, this was... The, Rachel sent these to us, and you were talking about these stats. This is what I was referring to. This is crazy. Oh, the percentage of people that actually have eye yes. strain. No, it's crazy. It yeah, crazy. so the American Optomet uh, Optometric Association estimates that 50 to 90% of computer users, which is everybody, have symptoms of what's known as computer vision syndrome. Did you guys even know that that, that was a, a, a thing that they call <laughs> oh, computer vision syndrome? I remember no. the very first meeting that I had with them, and they and they, they mentioned it in conversation, the importance of it, and what motivated them to start the company. Yeah, it's, mm. it's, that, I, it's a, that it's a real thing, and it's a, that, which is why I think we're seeing, <clears throat> we're seeing them pop up everywhere now. You've seen a lot of our other influencer buddies and stuff that are starting to promote all these other brands. Uh, again, I, I mean, it's, it's why I was so pumped that we have somebody like Taylor who can vet a company and, and court them for six months plus before we do any sort of business with them. And I really think that we have the best of the best that we're working with. Well, so look at these stats, right? So first off, the digital eye syndrome is eye strain, headaches, blurred vision, dry eyes, neck and shoulder pain. And check, this is pretty weird here, or this is kind of interesting. 57% of baby boomers have it or, or report having it. 63% of Generation Y 70% for millennials. And I can only imagine what the... Wow, already. I can, I can only imagine what the younger generation... Well, it's just well they grew up with it. Yeah, yeah. It, well, it just become. It's... Uh, I mean, I saw the stat, too, that the average American is spending seven and a half hours in front of a screen mm -hmm. a day. Mm -hmm. That's fucking insane. That's a lot. That's a, that's a job. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, just think of your lives. Case, I mean, I didn't have a computer until I was 20. Mm -hmm. So the first 20 years of my, and the phones that we had then were at best, I mean, I didn't even have a, a phone until- No, we had like, pagers. Yeah. <sighs> so what screen were you, I mean, maybe a little bit of TV time during TV. the week, yeah. but for yeah. an hour or two? I had like a Game Boy, but it was like that crappy yellow, like tiny screen. Yep. Right. I mean, so think about how much total screen time that you were probably spending as just a young adult or and child- maybe an hour or two at Very best many, yeah. and, and and you probably go days maybe sometimes weeks with zero or none well the type of light that's emitted by electronic devices is uh, uh, that now they they've know now that it's not good for your eyes it's actually quite damaging mm -hmm. um and some there's some alarming studies out there to be quite honest with you they're not conclusive but they're piling up and they're quite alarming showing permanent damage mm -hmm. to the eyes. Um, I, I predict this. I predict it will be standard. Like your company, wherever you work, if you work in front of a computer, it'll be part of their, what they do. It's is like eye safety. Yeah, oh, they're, yeah, yeah, exactly. They're going to require you to wear blue blocking well, face glasses or put a blue blocking screen in front of your computer. Uh, yeah, Facebook, sure. uh, Google, who else? Our, they all signed with Apple, Felix Gray. Right? No. Apple, yeah. yeah they? Apple, yeah. Oh, Google. they all signed with Felix Gray? Yeah. Oh, of course. They're all, they've all partnered up with them, and that's like, and, and I'm sure it'll come to a point where it's it's mandatory. What, what, what's the thing, and I always forget to mention it because whenever we talk about Felix Gray, what is the thing that your your company has? The the it's not oh, a health savings account, right? So so it's not ta it's tax deductible, right? It's no, it's it's, it's it's tax free. Yes, it's money you put in there that doesn't get taxed, and then you can use that money for uh, health 
type stuff. And then stuff. it goes away if you don't use it, right? I believe, so. Yeah. I so. I believe so. Yeah. I believe so. You want to look into that. And a lot of companies have this, right? What's it? It's HCA or FCA? HSA. HSA? Is it? HSA account, yeah. Uh, I thought there was two different ones. I thought, I thought there was another one, too. I remember him bringing it up. But you can thought. use that to buy Felix Gray glasses because they consider it you know, under that category or whatever. Yeah. But I do, I do predict, I predict that in the near future, if you work, uh, if your job involves being in front of a computer screen, that your company will require you to wear blue blocker glasses, or they will put the screen in front of the computer that blocks blue light or something. Because now that studies are coming out showing Mm -hmm. that it's it's damaging to your eyes is damaging. First of all, it's damaging to productivity because if you feel like shit, you're not going to be as productive. But if studies, which they are showing that it's actually damaging, like a real world damaging, they're going to want to cover their asses. Because once the studies come out, then of course they open themselves up to where employees then Which can- is why the, the Googles, the Apples, the, all these forward thinking companies mm-hmm. are already on it. Mm-hmm. And so you're going to, I think it's a, another, you know, growing trend that I think we're on the front end of that we're going to see. You're going to see, and that's- Promotes we, good digital wellness, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, I, I 100% agree. Yep. Yep. And uh, on that note, uh, the World Health Organization just announced that video game addiction oh, I saw that article. is an official- I shared that actually on my story. It's an official mental health disorder. Crazy. Video game addiction? They, they name it. Yeah, officially. Video, mm-hmm. Wow. And it, by, by the way- I mean, it's, it's kind of an obvious thing, but yeah. like for them to acknowledge that is pretty a big deal. Well, I mean, it's not- So I, I want to be clear. If you play a lot of video games and you love video games, you're-, you're you don't have video game addiction. Video you're, game addiction. You're a normal kid. Yeah. yeah. Video game addiction is when it starts to interfere. Takes over your whole life. Yeah. It interferes with regular life. They were talking about some cases where kids would play 15 or 20 hours straight mm-hmm. of video games uh, where they wouldn't eat and it, it where it's really has a, uh, the characteristics of well, an addiction. You know where, right. where it really hit home for me. So I was a, a gamer right? Quote unquote, for a long time. And for me, it, I actually started when I hit about 27 <clears throat> and up and up until 27, this was like, you know, and I, my best friend lived with me in our, my mid and early twenties when I had got my place. And so we had the bachelor pad and it was like, we used to say this all the time when we were like dating girls, like no girl is going to get in between our gaming time. Wow. Well, you really, you really said that? Yeah, bro. We, <laughs> we, we used to- Bros. Bros. Yeah, bros. Totally. Totally that <laughs> yeah. guy. hundred percent admit that. And we, we, and I believed, and I remember people used to tell me when I was younger, like, oh, when you get older, you're not going to play video games. Like you play video. And I'm like, bullshit. I, it's one of my favorite pastimes. I love doing it. My best friends and I bond doing it. And you're in your twenties. <clears throat> yeah. And I'm in my twenties. Mm-hmm. I'm in my mid to late twenties. And, and I used to have an, uh, a, a good, really close friend of mine that was a good five years older than me, and he used to always tease me. When are you going to grow up and stop playing video games? And I'm like, oh, fuck you. I've, grown, I've, you know, I've got a six-figure job. I have my house. i got all this shit, and I play video games. Fuck you. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Like That was kind of like my, I had this chip mm-hmm. on my shoulder that I could be successful and still have all this stuff going for me. And at one point, the the Halo, uh, it was I think it was Halo 2 was out. So whatever year that is, people can try and figure out the timeline of this story. Um, I just started getting nauseous. I couldn't, the first player, and I played those games my whole life. <clears throat> now all of a sudden at 27, I get like just so nauseous I have to vomit. Oh, like motion sickness. <clears throat> yes. Huh? Wow. And I thought the first time that I was sick, I thought, oh, wow, I must be coming down with the flu. I went and threw up, came back on the couch to play again, and I was like, oh, I can't play anymore. I must be sick. Lay down, slept it off, was fine. And then, like the next two or three times in a row that I tried to play, I started to realize that it was from the video game this was happening, and that was the beginning of the end for video games. Now I could still play other games, and I did for a while, and I remember my buddy constantly still teasing me. The thing that I noticed about it, being somebody who I would say, I don't know if I, I would say I was addicted because I still had a life, I still had a lot of things going for me, but what it did do, no matter what, even if I wasn't addicted to where it was like hurting me, it. It took up the time that I've used today to to grow and better myself and 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 uh, excel in other aspects totally. of life. Yeah, you know, I mean, it it could it would consume two hours of my night every night, sometimes more. And weekends, I could spend six hours straight playing with my buddies. And now that I wasn't doing that, I had to find other things to fill that space. Mm-hmm. And that's where kind of reading started to happen for me. And I think that was the biggest thing with that was it was sure it wasn't so bad that it was an addiction and it was I was unhealthy or I wasn't able to have relation. I had all those things, but sure. 
boy, did freeing up that time to do things that would better me, better myself. Boy, did that yeah. it really accelerate it's, it's my It's entertainment, and entertainment mm-hmm. has a certain amount of value, um, but it also can be overdone, and, and it can crowd out things that provide more value. Now, if you're sitting there playing with your friends and you guys are bonding over it, there's some value to that, um, but it, it could also get out of hand. I Look, I noticed, I noticed that recently we were just on a trip, um, and I saw it again. We, we were on a trip recently with our, our kids, and my son, if I don't like literally police him, he'll be on his phone or on playing video games until I tell him to stop. He'll literally, and it, and it changes his behavior. It does it to my daughter too, although she's not as fanatical about it, but it'll change his behavior. It'll make him super absorbed in what he's doing and disconnected <coughs> from everything and everyone around him. Yep. And I have to get to the point where I have to get mad and be like, I'm take, I have to take it from him. I'm taking your phone. You're off of it. And then there's like a two hour period where he's just irritated that I took his phone. And then all of a sudden he comes out and he's like hanging out with everybody, hey, talking, I'm back in the world, having a good, and, and it's, it's, it's a scary, yeah. it's, it's really a, a, such an obvious switch. Like I notice when my kids are on video games or on their phones or mm-hmm. on TV, if I leave them on too long and then I, I try to engage with them, they're snappy, irritable. They're just not pleasant to be around. Yeah. When I take them off, there's a withdrawal period, and then it's like, oh, there you are, like you're you're cool again. Well, it's a little worrisome to me because I do I, I see the same behavioral things with my kids as they play, but like because now the games like a Minecraft or uh, Roblox or you know whatever these popular games are, where it's like this expansive world that has like so many possibilities where they can just build, they can see their friends in there. Like they can, you know, attack zombies. Like there's just the creative freedom is like almost endless and you just get so sucked into that Mm -hmm. environment because it's like, I mean, if I was a kid, I'd fucking love that. Oh my gosh. It's like, I wouldn't survive today. No, it's like, it's so it, like engaging it's it's a lot of times like what i worry about is the the virtual reality that's coming that will make it like this is actually better for me in here than real life like mm-hmm. real life sucks like i just want to hang out here and i could see like kids really getting sucked into that and like it becoming a problem oh no and and i mean as addicting as tv was when we were kids just multiply it times a million uh because these games are so interactive and so it's it's going to be, look, it's like anything else. You have to, just like with processed food when that first came out, it's like, you know, it was it, it's easier to not overeat when you're not eating foods that are designed to make you overeat and, and to, to an extent where it's almost not fair. Well, what's happening with, with video games and, you know, digital products, <clears throat> apps and social media and all that stuff for adults even, is that they're engineered – like processed foods were to make you over consume, to keep you on, to keep you checked in. And so you have to develop practices around that. And wh- what happens with kids is they are young and they don't know how to develop those practices. And so, and it's hard, it's hard as a parent because you have to be an asshole mm-hmm. sometimes. And then you have to deal with, cause here's the deal. Sometimes you're at home and you'd rather your kids be quiet and just play video games or whatever, because now you're not dealing with the noise and the complaints and what are we doing? What's going but you got to deal with it sometimes, so it's uh, it's so I you know I, it's 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 a constant struggle, definitely mm-hmm. a con. But every time I see the difference between my kids when they're on it a lot and when they're not, it always makes me like shake my head, like wow, that is it's a powerful thing, dude. It's so yeah. I, mean, I mean you, you have to treat it as such. I mean you could see it. We were on this trip, like I said, my son was on his phone for the first half. The second half, I took him off of it. Totally different kid. Yeah, and it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy to me. Anyway. It's, I imagine it's tough as a parent too, like. The fuck, because you also don't want to be the parent who doesn't allow him to play. Like I had some of my favorite times when I was a kid were playing video games with my buddies, and I look at where I'm at in my life today, and I think I made it okay. Like you know, I wasn't like it didn't Mm -hmm. fuck me up as a as a as an adult. Yeah. So you know, like where do you draw the line? And we have trust me, we had some. I mean, as a kid, I remember (laughs) I was just with my best friend this last weekend, and we actually did fire up the old game console and play. Uh, and I haven't played, and probably the last time you ever heard me mention on this podcast was probably a couple of years ago. Uh, and we played, and it was a good time. And while we were playing, we were actually sharing memories of like, oh, did you remember when we used to hole up for a yeah. whole weekend? And then the how many was, hours I was dude, like playing Zelda? We would order pizza and not leave the bedroom, yeah. and there would be pizza boxes and sodas lining the entire room, like up on the window seal and all those things. Oh be, wow! Yeah, that's and we would eat 
pizza and Pepsi and just w- play video games like around the clock for all of Saturday and Sunday. He, here's where Crazy. I, here's where I think yeah. the, the, the the problems arise from that. You're right. It didn't fuck you up. And I watched TV all the time. I was not a video game fanatic, but my parents used to have to kick me off the TV because they still love. And I would watch educational shit. I would watch documentaries and stuff like that. But I would be on the TV for out. If you left me, I could do it from morning till evening. And I'm not fucked up either, but I do notice this. I do notice that I have a very tough time focusing. I do notice that I tend to be scatterbrained and a little ADD, and I think that's probably what we got from it. What we probably got from it is that we lost the ability to... We we can hyper-focus or not. We lost the ability to pay attention to things around us, to be present, or at least it wasn't practiced as much because we were always on on this device or whatever that was just driving our attention and so that's what i find now and i find it hard to be to not do anything like try standing in line without your phone and just looking around or not reading when you're in the bathroom or whatever yeah you know that's right actually came- yeah actively trying to do that it's tough man like just being in line for coffee or whatever and i'm just like staring at the wall i'm staring at people's clothes i'm staring at you know whatever's on writing you know somewhere like a painting over mm-hmm. there. it's like what do you do to entertain your mind and then it starts kind of working out these things these ideas i've been you know thinking about so it, it actually it's a good practice but it's tough because it's like I, it's tough to be bored man yeah. well this is why i think uh meditation is on the rise because mm-hmm. uh we don't realize this but the day has all these little uh micro meditation moments mm-hmm. that we are we are slowly everybody is starting to eliminate um and we don't even realize it so a practice that maybe many people didn't think twice about and was never a part of their life are finding uh, a lot of necessity in because they've eliminated those moments. You know, you stand in a line, you uh, you wait for something to download, you do you do all these different things that throughout your day where you in the past would be by yourself in in yourself in your own thoughts, and that and it's even if it's a short window of a two minute wait in a line, it's somewhat meditative, mm-hmm. right? Because you are thinking about your day and you're thinking about what you got going on. Or you're just being present. Right, being present. Mm -hmm. And that's now been taken away because we always have our phones that we're attached to. We have filled every space with something. (laughs) Yeah. Every single space. We don't know how to be bored anymore. And I I noticed this, like when when I do these short trips, uh, like the one we were just on uh, at, at Yosemite, I was on electronics very, very minimally compared to what I normally use. Yeah. I wasn't on my phone at all except to- clear out my dms and, and all that stuff and it feels good mm-hmm. when i come back i'm like refreshed and then i realize oh wow that that i need to do that on a on a semi-regular basis yeah anyway and it's tough man i, I know as a parent if you're if you're listening it, it's hard it's hard especially if you're a single parent like oh, yeah. i get my kids half the time right so the other half the time they're with their mom they come see me half the time and it, it makes it hard for me because I'm, I don't want to be an asshole the half the time they're with me. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's like, oh, I haven't seen you for a week. Now I want to be, but now I got to tell you, give me your phone. Right. Don't watch TV. You got to remind them all the rules. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's like, yeah, it's tough. It's, 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 it's pretty, it sucks. But anyway, um, dude, uh, did you guys see that article I shared on UFOs? Are you guys into UFO kind of stuff? Not really. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> he's probably more than I am. I am kind of. I mean, I was actually just listening to a podcast. Joe Rogan had this lady on that was talking about uh, like a, a different type of conspiracy, it mainly being around um, like Stalin and like how his propaganda, like, like, like Area 51, like that was part of like some kind of conspiracy where he was trying to like implant this. Uh, this thought that aliens actually existed through propaganda. And then like they had these like propaganda wars between the two. And it was a different angle on the whole aliens, uh, you know, uh, area 51 thing. And I thought that was kind of interesting. Well, I don't, so uh, I, I knew it cause at area 51, we thought, Oh, there was an alien spacecraft that crashed there and this and that. But then we learned later on, that's actually where they were making um, super secret, uh, like, Aircraft like the Blackbird, right? You know things that could fly super yeah, they high, super fast. Classified all that, yeah. yeah. And so, and what they did is they they put out bullshit information stories so that people didn't think that there was actual you know navy or, or army stuff there. That was oh no, there's UFO stuff. So it's kind of that counter mm-hmm. intelligence type of thing, right? But uh, I'm reading this article in the New York Times, and these are they're interviewing people in the Navy, lieutenants, for example, 
and pilots who are saying, oh, no, we see shit in videotapes. And they release some of the stuff. We see weird, unexplained aerial phenomena all the time yeah. where there are these, these, these flying, we don't know what, that are moving extremely fast or changing directions. And I'm watching, and there's videos. You can actually watch the videos of these recordings. Mm. And they stay in the air for 11 hours or 12 hours. And he's like, you know, we, we do the math at the type of energy you would need to generate to move that fast and to produce those aerial maneuvers. And they shouldn't be able to last longer than an hour. Yeah. And these things are up there for 11 hours. One uh, F-18 Hornet pilot almost got hit by one of these these flying UFOs where it flew so close to him, it almost hit him. And then it changed directions. Oh, damn. And these are all, like, th this is all declad. These are all people talking about it now. Like, this happened in 2014, 2015. Crazy, right? Yes. Yeah. So for me, like to follow along, like more of a rational train of thought, if I eliminate aliens from that, then you start thinking about drone technology and how they had that way, way, way before we have it now today. Uh, and they were fucking with people with that in terms of like showing like spacecraft and all that uh, to where now what... What technology they're working on through, like a lot of their, uh, like through DARPA and all that, is like twenty five years way beyond That's where we are today, yeah. right? So it's like, of course, like they're gonna throw it out there and experiment, uh, you know, to see if it works, and people are gonna see it. Uh, so I don't know. That's that's, that's I, I lean more in that direction than I do aliens. That's what I think. That's a hundred percent where I'm at. Yeah, I, I think mean, it's I, a military, like high, high, super secret, I, high tech military. Right. Shit. How many yeah. times do we we hear about the latest, greatest, you know, thing that the that, that we've created, and it's like then we find out that they had been building that. Yeah, for, they invented that forty years ago. Yeah, yep. and it's we just now as the general population get to see it, and so if you're you know, just some, you know, uh, F-16 or F-18 fighter pilot and you're out on a routine flight, like, you don't you don't get all the classified mm. shit, yeah, you know what I'm saying? You know yeah, that. you don't get to know about that stuff. So, sure, maybe you do see some things like that and then it doesn't make sense to you because you're not downloaded all the information. Well, over. remember when um, Desert Storm, that was the first Iraqi war, that's when we unveiled the uh, the stealth fighters and stealth bombers. Uh -huh. That was the first time the public saw these jets that... And weren't they building that like in the 50s or 60s? Like Some, in the 70s and 60s. Yeah, like early, that, that technology had been... They were spying on everybody before. It, they only unveiled it because they, they found them. They would have kept going and not like you told anybody about it. Well, Otherwise. sometimes I think we unveil thing and we show things to intimidate yeah, the too. superpower. So like, uh, we got this Iraq war. Let's show them a little bit of what, what we some of our old shit that we have or whatever. <laughs> <Some> old shit. <laughs> so if you think about this it, is yeah, last, this old last year's model hunk of junk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you think about it, like these uh, these unidentified flying objects that these pilots are seeing that are moving at like supersonic or faster speeds, that are changing crazy directions, that are doing all this crazy stuff. Maybe, like like you guys are saying, it's a it's a U.S. military thing. We're letting them see it on purpose so that it gets out in the news, so that our enemies in this, you know, the Russians or the Chinese, they know what's going on. They're like, oh, okay, yeah, they got some crazy shit they're trying to show us, but they're pretending like they don't. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it'd be it'd be a, it'd be a nice little way to intimidate the opposing side. I can get down with that. For sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I can get down with that theory. Yeah, it kind of kind of crazy, right? right. I, I would love to know. Yeah. What they have. Well, or maybe I wouldn't. I don't know. Tom DeLonge is all in. You know, that guy from Blink-182, he's uh, he's super convinced there's aliens and like trying to work with government officials. I everything. feel like if aliens exist well, and they're I've visiting us, their technology would be so crazily advanced that we wouldn't know anything. Yeah. You know well, what I'm saying? I've tra I've trained, I don't even know they were here. I've trained clients that have worked for NASA, that have worked for NORAD, that have worked like that have had, and they've they have told me that there's. There is so much stuff that they can't discuss with their wife and obviously me that is so beyond what I would think. And that to me is already enough. Like, and so they're like, there's so much. Yeah, there's stuff out there. There has to be classified stuff that that you will never hear about or well, you don't. Well, how know much about. money do we spend this on was our like military? Fifteen years ago. When yeah. How, how big is our military bu budget? So you guys know? Stupid, bro. Yeah. Way past the trillions. What's next? Yeah, after that? yeah. It's 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 massive. I don't remember the exact. Let me find out what the number is here. It's a massive, massive, massive amount. Quadrillions. We, I'm still mad that we have a we have a, we've learned we've built 
a spaceship that can go to the moon, land on the moon, and return itself and land back on Earth, but yet we can't get a fucking car to drive more than 100,000 miles without the transmission bus. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's engineered in, dude. That is fucking bullshit, bro. People make money on the service. And why does my iPhone, every new iPhone I buy, super high speed, and then yeah. exactly one year later, all of a sudden- They want you to buy new ones. Well, actually- That's my- uh, this, yeah. here's, Let's here, talk about that conspiracy. Here's the truth. Yeah. Here's the that's truth. true. That stuff does exist. The problem is that it would cost more money than you would be- Bullshit. Bullshit. Bro, let me put it this Bullshit. way. Bullshit. We spend, so put it, okay, we spend over, okay, on paper, it's something like almost a trillion dollars uh, that we spend on, on the military, but the real amount of money that we spend is more than that, because there's a lot of shit we don't see. There's a lot of this money that doesn't- Right, that's all the shit that's tracked, that uh, they yeah. have to show all the, the all the receipts to. Yep, yeah, yep. The so CIA's going to take a piece. Then it's 4X, yeah, 4X times that, that that's, all undercover, right? that's all undercover, That's all undercover. That's all undercover. NASA's going to take this piece. Bro, we spend more on our military than the next, I don't know, 10 countries combined. Like, you know what I'm saying? It's insane. So, to I can't even we gotta imagine. got to stay on top, man. I can't even imagine. I would, I'll tell you what, though. I would never want to work for those organizations and know that shit because- you know that they would just spy on you all the time to make sure you don't tell anybody. Of course. You know what I'm saying? You'd be paranoid <laughs> as fuck. Yeah. Every time you run the internet, yeah, don't tell me anything. Look, yeah. look up porn, you're like, yeah. fuck, John Ignorance knows exactly. Ignorance is bliss. But I'm <laughs> Bro, speaking of that, did you read the Martin Luther King thing, dude? Oh, yeah. Bro. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm like, that, they, it like hurt my heart to well, read so, that. Well, so we should let the audience kind of know a little bit of backstory here. So Martin Luther King Jr., uh, the civil rights leader, obviously American hero, um, he was spied on quite a bit by the FBI um, for a few different reasons. One, he was the leader of a counterculture at the time movement, um, and this was during the height of the Cold War. So any threat, you know, the FBI uh, or even the CIA was like, we need to like monitor any all threats because right. the Soviet Union's big. And they could be infiltrating these counterculture movements and all that stuff. Was it that or was it that he was friends with communists? Well, that was also... So uh, he was actually a Republican. He was a pro-freedom you know, freedom kind of guy himself. But he led a lot of people. And he was one of his associates, apparently, they thought was a communist. So uh -huh. anyway, nonetheless, yeah. nonetheless, it's bullshit. Uh, there, there's, the guy shouldn't have been surveyed like that. But they did. And they used to bug his hotel rooms and follow him around. And um, and then there's the infamous note that was written to him by the FBI where the FBI said, hey, we have all this evidence that you've been cheating on your wife with all these people. Mm -hmm. We suggest that you commit suicide. That was a, that's a, that's something that people say actually happened so, because they, they wanted him out of the picture and they wanted to use kind of blackmail. Mm. But anyway, there's this journalist who uh, apparently has access to these audio recordings and written recordings by, by CIA and FBI agents on Martin Luther King. And the, now these recordings are going to be released in 2027 because there's a period of time for, for things to stay classified and then they'll either get released or they'll be reclassified and then extend. So in 2027, these things are supposed to be released. This journalist apparently has access to some of this stuff and he's saying that Martin Luther King had upwards of 40 affairs um, participated in orgies and here's the crazy part apparently there was an audio recording of one of his Martin Luther King's associates raping someone it was a pastor a pastor and Martin Luther King being in the room and not stopping it and, and even laughing mm. at the whole thing now this is all uh, right now there's no evidence of this but the person who's saying that this happened is a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, journalist I believe so it's not like it's someone without any credibility, but fuck, man, if that's yeah, I true, I read it on like a Business Insider. It's not some of the. It's not like Buzzfeed right. or one of those bullshit fucking yeah. articles. Yeah, uh, if this is true, man, that's going to be devastating. That's yeah, devastating. He's he's one of my heroes. I know. You know what I mean? He's he, he's a, a pioneer of civil disobedience. civil nonviolent disobedience. This is this is a big <sighs> the beginning of this this and man, that's that's back then. It's going to be fucking crazy twenty years from now. Yeah. If you're somebody, you don't even need to have someone spy on you. Yeah. If no, you're just if, releasing all this information about yourself, if you're yourself. in politics or you're a public figure at all, how many people are going to get crucified for the things that they did twenty years, yeah. fifteen years, 20, thirty? Well, years I mean, earlier? To, to be fair, uh, the affairs part, fine, whatever. If it if he really was in a room while his pastor was raping someone, 
that's totally oh, I, that's a whole I 100% thing. agree with that. I like I I yeah, don't in, infidelity to me is I mean it's so widely rampant. It's a human flaw. Right, you know? it is it is a human flaw it's, and it's uh in some It's not good, but it's not Yeah, and some will even argue that it's it's our animal instinct in nature to be this way, which is comes from the all the people that believe in the open relationship. So when it comes to like infidelity and that stuff, like I don't that to me, whatever. If he, if you have a an overarching message that's helping us as a whole, like Mark, like Martin Luther King's mission, uh, I, I don't really, I don't really care about his, if he was promiscuous or not. But like you said, you know, standing by why somebody gets raped is a that's a whole different. Ball that's a whole game. different, and I that's mean, what the guy, that's what the guy says uh, that the FBI agents recorded. Uh, happening, mm-hmm. so I don't know if this is going to be real, you know, if it's going to come out. But right now, it's kind of making some waves. Um, but it, apparently, all this information is supposed to be released in 2027. All wow. these audio recordings and stuff that they do. You no, think there's no will... comment from his estate either? Huh? No, no. I mean, the guy. Look, regardless of whatever happened, um, and I'm not saying if he did that, that means you know that doesn't mean he's a bad person. I think he'd be a terrible person if that happened. But it doesn't discredit the good things that happened because of other things that he did. And again, I'm not saying the guy is good or bad. Well, I'm just saying he. You know, I want people to understand that, like, you know, uh, people can be, and this is just humans can be really fucking evil and do good shit yeah. also, which is really it, weird and hard to say. Yeah. Well, it's, and it's hard to wrap, to understand and wrap your well, brain. Well, it's around. crazy that this is coming out right now, and it's following the conversation that we just had what a couple of days ago on Tony Robbins. Mm. You know, uh, um, you know, regardless of what he said or did, you know, 20 years ago, agree with it, disagree with it, true, not true. I mean, you, there's no, you can't argue that he's uh, that he fundamentally impacted, yeah. you know, millions of people for the good that have helped him. Uh, that, that doesn't necessarily make him a good human himself. Maybe he did stuff that was bad also. Yeah. I mean, I look at the same way that I look at even like professional athletes. Like I always, I always laugh with my buddies and I, we were recently debating uh, some sports stuff and you know, my buddy was, you know, throwing out things about his character. And I'm like, dude, this is not a, we're having a, a, a sports debate right now. We are debating statistics, what he did in sports. I don't give a fuck about his personal life. I'm not, this isn't, I'm not rep, I'm not arguing that he's a great man and a great uh, person we should look up to. I'm saying he's the best at this yeah. or he's the best at that. And I think we have to learn to separate that when we talk about people like this, like, you know, hands down what, what he did was, Incredible! What do you? Yeah. Yeah, I don't care. And he could have also done some really bad things. So we have to be able to separate that. People have a hard time. Yeah, doing I'm very that. slow to that. Yeah, that's why I'm skeptical of like anybody that's in a very moral high position, you know, and like really like uh, projecting that morality on everybody else. Uh, like I'm always like, oh really? Like what makes you so self righteous? Mm. Uh, so anyway, that's always red flags for me. But yeah, that's it's tough though when you get somebody that's like a very you know, historically, like, like important, awesome human being, and then you find shit about him. And you're like, I again, didn't want to know that. What'll happen is it'll it'll create this kind of debate of, uh, you know, it, where people will discredit the stuff that he did that was good. Maybe like, oh, that means that you know he, what he did wasn't. It. No, you can't do that. Yeah, and it, again, he, people are. We're not good and we're not bad. We're both. We do good and bad shit. And obviously, if he did that, that would have been a totally evil, despicable thing. But if we take it back a little bit, um, you know, people, we do good and bad things uh, all the time. It's super complex. But our brains, we like to put people in categories. Yeah. You know, and that's why it's so shocking and shattering. But you're right. Something like this, man, if this turned out to be true, that'll be, I'll be devastated personally. Yeah. Because this is, again, this is a person that I've, considered one of my heroes uh since I was a kid because again he's he he exemplified nonviolent uh civil disobedience which uh requires a tremendous amount of courage um to do and it's actually one of the most effective ways to make things happen this is uh, why I have a hard time even with the question like that when people ask like oh do you who is your hero growing up or who do you have heroes like totally it's I, I've I've always struggled with that because I didn't have any really you know and I don't, I, I've never really idolized uh, somebody, yeah. especially somebody who's famous or well known for something, because again, uh, something that I've de- definitely pieced together in my short journey on this earth is the more exceptional that somebody is at, at a single 
thing, mm-hmm. uh, the more dysfunction they have other places in their life. It's what made them great at whatever that one thing is, is their their whole life right. has been dedicated to being to excelling at a, a single thing that it's it's almost inevitable that there's going to be out of balance somewhere else in their, in their life. And that, that could be morally, it could be uh, with relationships, it could be character, their own character, like whatever. But it, uh, more not, more often than not, this is what I have found well, in my life. Well, here's the other side of this that, that a lot of people aren't talking about. So, okay, let's, let's just say that that did happen and Martin Luther King was in the room and didn't stop this pastor from doing that horrible thing. There were FBI agents that were listening and they didn't stop. They didn't do anything. They didn't stop. And and now we get into this weird, complex, you know, situation where does that make them also bad? Now, my opinion, yes. Yeah. I don't give a fuck what your job is. You see something that's going... And this happens all the time with law enforcement. Well, they watch terrible shit going on and they'll let it happen because they're trying to... Build a case. Yeah. Or, or do something else. It, it, the, the truth is um, people think that inaction is not contributing that's not true when you're standing by and not doing anything you're allowing something to happen and that's something you have to tackle within yourself so yeah. i think that, that i think the fact that the that if this happened that this woman that it wasn't stopped and that she wasn't avenged by the by that's law an, enforcement that's fucked up that's an interesting mm-hmm. point that you bring up it's true I, well i mean our laws are set though to 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 protect that right or make that happen example like if you if uh, you're being if you're investigating somebody for uh, you know something that has nothing to do with them being a sex offender or at all, they and they're recording and they're bugging them like they're they're actually supposed they can't it's not admissible in court. Right. They can't take that evidence because it has nothing to do with why they got the warrant for the for the bug in the first place. And so if you're listening for whatever said reason. And just because they talk about or they do something else that could be criminal or talk about something else, it's not admissible in court because that's not what they're being bugged for. I totally get what you're That's crazy. Yeah, those laws, I understand those laws. I know where they come from. But as a human being- Right, right. You know what I mean? You're watching something. You're like, okay, well, my job says I can't do anything about this, but somebody's getting hurt right now. I'm just surprised. What the fuck? What fascinates me is how how this hasn't surfaced earlier. Oh, it was. it's all sealed, uh, you know, and apparently this guy got access to it. Yeah, he, uh, somehow, but it's, you just listen to the tape. It was all hidden, like yeah. it, not hidden, but uh, no one has access to it. And again, it's supposed to be released. But it's crazy. I would, I would think that even uh, like the the girl who got raped, or her her best friend, or her sister, or her mom, or her aunt. Well, like, she might have never said anything to anybody. Maybe right. Yeah. I just that's what I find fascinating, though. It's like yeah. or crazy to me. It's just say fascinating. It's crazy to me that you know the amount of people that were pot- potentially involved mm-hmm. in it, or around it, or connected to those people. How how does something like this stay suppressed for that long? That's, I don't know. That's crazy. I don't know. Anyway, I hope it's not true. So we'll see what happens. Um, uh, another interesting piece of news uh, on, on a different note. Uh, Hungary. Did you see their new tax policy that they're trying to release? No. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure I want to bring this up because I want to make sure I have it. I have it, like, it right is here. Is it comical or what was it? Um. Well. So in 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 many European countries, they're suffering from uh, population shrinking. Where, or population not growing fast enough to support itself. Um, with governments, if a population can't replace itself or more than replace itself, their systems just don't work. Uh, for example, um, if we're, let's say we're all paying into Social Security, we need more people paying into it than taking out. If the population shrinks, that's done. And so lots of things kind of break down. And Hungary is kind of in that, in that situation. And so the prime minister of Hungary is trying to pass a measure to boost birth rates. And what it is, is for every family that has, for every citizen that has four or more kids, they will never have to pay an income tax for the rest of their life. So if you're, yeah, so if you're, so if you're a family and you have three kids and then you have a fourth kid, now you pay no income taxes. Oh my God. (laughs) That's such backwards thinking. Yeah, what? Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, it solves the it solves the issue of of the population starting to decline. It will spike that back up, but then it, you'll just be in a different you'll be in a different it's situation. Just, yeah, it's just interesting <laughs> how they how we use tax policy to, to feed to yeah, promote yeah. what we want yeah. or whatever, and more and more jobs. <laughs> I don't know. Think about that though. If uh, you think about it this way, if you had three kids, 
and you knew having one more. Oh, bro, hundred percent. You know, <laughs> yeah, taxes. Yeah. There's some incentive there. That's half why yeah. you don't have three yeah. and four. Hey, you're because my tax free kid. They yeah, say the, they yeah. Say <laughs> the average kid costs about two hundred thousand. That's average kid, and this is like this is not college. This is not a, like the average kid to raise to eighteen. They say costs between two hundred and two hundred fifty thousand dollars. So that's a quarter million dollar per kid. I mean, that's a, and not a lot of people have a million dollars in 18 years. Not, I don't know anybody that can save a million dollars in 18 years. Yeah. So think about that. That's, you know, and if you got exempt from taxes by having one more, like, yeah, that's yeah. a no brainer, I feel like. Isn't that funny? What if you're the fourth kid? Free Bird Freddy. <laughs> yeah, you know, you got like nicknames you're, for him. Yeah, you're the fourth kid, you know? Yeah. You get older and you'd like, Wait exempt. A Thanks, we call. Dad, did you have me? <laughs> yeah. Did you guys want me, or was, was like, it? You know, you could just stand over there. We just uh, <laughs> yeah. we call you, we have you for tax purposes. Yeah, yeah we call you TB for tax TB. break. Yeah. Tax break. <laughs> TB. Tax break, Bobby. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Tax break, yeah. Bobby. Yeah. We'll see what it, we'll see what ends up happening. I think it's an interesting policy. Uh, but I, it's funny how governments do that. They try to they, they, they manipulate the tax code to get people to. To change their behaviors according to what they God, want or whatever. Let us be. Right. And just let it let it play out. No, yeah. man. It's yeah. like a it's like a big board game for them. You yeah. Know? It's yeah. Like, well, what I like about this is that rather than taxing you more for not having kids, they're just making you pay less tax. What I really hate is when they tax you for shit. Anything that gets you to pay less, that's fine with me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But it's when they charge to charge you more. Like, oh, if you only have two, if you, you have less than four kids, we're going to charge you more tax. We're going to you're going to pay more. And instead, they're doing kind of the reverse. So. Dude, you know how we always make these analogies about, you know, enjoying the journey and the process and, like, you know, compare it to, like, like summiting Mount Everest? Mm -hmm. Have you guys seen what's been happening, like, this year at Mount Everest with these, like, tours and everything? That no, no, there? no. So I guess, like, it's there's been a lot of these, like, little Sherpa tour kind of businesses that have popped up there, like, a lot of them, like, trying to undercut each other and, like, uh, so there's cheaper options. So this created like a lot more volume on the mountain this year. And it's been like the fourth worst uh, death toll rate that they've had where they've had 11 die already. And like there's bodies that people are just like stepping over what? Uh, that they that they, they haven't brought down yet. Get out of here. Yes. There's like a lineup to, to summit. Like there was this like traffic jam of people like trying to summit that. It's because I guess one of the big problems is a lot of these people aren't like like doing the due diligence of like getting physically fit and able to really summit something. It's like, like this. literally a bucket list thing that they put on. It's them. a bucket they're like, list. They're like, "Fuck it, I'm 65. Like, my heart's like, terrible, yeah. but I've always said I want to climb Mount Everest." Like, hey, doing... I got a group on. Like, I'm, I'm going for it. <laughs> yeah, it's like, dude, what the fuck are you doing, dude? Those Sherpas are crazy. Those There's... Sherpas go up and down all that the shit. time. Yeah. All the time. What's the estimated time to get from top to bottom? I don't know. You I mean from bottom to, bottom to top? Bottom to top. Yeah, so I have no looked that up. I have no idea. Maybe Doug can look that up. Yeah, I'm curious. But there's something like, I remember reading this stat a while ago. There's something like hundreds of bodies that are up there that they've just left. No way. Yes. No way. Yes. It's like too hard to get, get them. Yeah, sometimes. because it's too much work and too hard and dangerous to get them down. Yeah, you're like, you'll die trying to, to, trying to no, get No, I literally read this on uh, in an article literally last week. Let's see. How long does it? What does that say? I don't see it. Most time. expeditions take around two months. Oh, wow. Two months? Fuck that. A grueling, like two months. Like each elevation creates, you know, uh, more challenges. So, how, how funny is that? Like, you remember, you, we see, we see, a, we see something that's the tallest thing in the world. We're like, you know, we should try climbing that. Yeah, like we could do it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, more than 300 people have died attempting to reach the summit. Wow. And there's something like hundreds of bodies up there. That have just been left. Mm -hmm. Holy cow. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. I didn't realize like it was like they showed a picture on the news uh, just recently of just this lineup of people waiting to get to the very top and summit. And it was just like, oh, my God. Wow. The article, the title of this article I brought up says the bodies of dead climbers on Everest are serving as guideposts. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, we must be at mile 45 or whatever. Dang. Yeah. See, that for me would totally... Um, make me want to dissuade go. me. Oh, yeah. You know, I'm climbing something, and then I see like, oh fuck, there's a frozen body. Oh, oh the there's another frozen body. Like, Neh. I'm like, dude, this kid, these guys only made it this far. We couldn't hang. Yeah, we uh, we got uh, this. Two, <laughs> two months of climbing. Dude. No way. That's You're crazy. Right. No thanks. <laughs> Maps Quaz brought to you by Maps Anabolic. 
If you're looking to maximize your overall muscle and strength, Maps Anabolic is the perfect place to start. With a full 30-day money-back guarantee, there is absolutely zero risk. So what are you waiting for? Go to mindpromedia.com and get started today. It's the motherfucking claw. The eagle has landed. Our first question is from Camilla Powell Fit. Can you speed up your metabolism by eating more calories and still do cardio? Not overdoing it, but just enough to maintain tightness. Uh, okay, so it's not super clear what she's asking. I, 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 she's she, wanting. She's wanting. She's listening to the show a lot. This is what I'm assuming. I'm just totally assuming this by the way she framed this question. Is she's wanting to boost her metabolism? She knows we've talked about the importance of increasing your calories in order to do that. She also has obviously listened to episodes where we've talked about, you know, doing cardio, too especially much cardio. too much cardio mm. sends a signal to the body to adapt and become efficient at that, which in, which inevitably would slow down your metabolism. So the question is, can you still speed your metabolism up by increasing calories and, and not changing anything else and also still doing cardio? So, yeah, but not a lot. But yeah, there is a, a metabolism boosting effect and a metabolism slowing down effect from manipulating calories alone. So if you lower your caloric intake, your body does try to adapt to it by slowing down its metabolism, by becoming more efficient at burning calories. And the reverse is also true. If you eat more calories, you do burn more calories as a result. But uh, you're going to be limited. You're going to be limited. Uh, this effect is limited if you're not sending a signal to your body to become stronger and build more muscle. And so what will end up happening is you'll eat a little bit more and notice I'm not gaining any weight on the scale. Eat a little more, no weight gain. Eat a little more, uh-oh, I'm getting body fat. And then from then on out, you're just gaining more body fat. Um, it is an important part of the metabolism boosting process to eat more calories, but you also, in my experience, have to simultaneously send the the right muscle building signals at the same time. Otherwise, you just end up uh, gaining more weight. But there is a small window. Like you, you know, I remember talking about this with another fitness pro uh, professional, where we noticed that when people cut or raise their calories, there was this little window before their body would actually do anything. So, like, you cut a little bit, and they still wouldn't lose any weight. Or we'd bump a little bit and they wouldn't gain any weight. So there's like this playroom uh, that that we that we have found through working with with clients uh, anecdotally. Mm. Um, but if you don't lift weights um, and, and do the right kind of training, it's not going to be very very limited. This reminded me of uh, you know those Group X instructors. I, I was always mystified when I would see and I saw this Group X instructor that was just constantly in there just hammering the classes like always uh working out cardio just cardio and i would see you know inevitably like weight gain mm. and, I, and i saw it just it just baffled me because back then it was very much just everything was calories in calories out to me and mm -hmm. i just I, I just could not wrap my brain around why the fact why it didn't look like she was losing any weight anymore mm -hmm. i remember when i did uh brazilian jiu-jitsu when i was training heavily in it, I would do uh, about four days a week of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And these are two and a half hour classes. Um, the first 45 minutes to an hour is a warm up, but it's really more of like a workout. Then you're doing some drills. And then the last like hour is just grappling at full speed or whatever with, with partners. So for all intents and purposes, I was burning a shit ton of calories doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Way more calories than when I was lifting weights. Okay? But I was leaner body fat wise when I was lifting weights. Now the reason being was when I did lots of jujitsu, I thought, oh, I can eat more calories as a result. And I found it was harder to do that and stay lean because my body wanted to kind of maintain this endurance and I didn't need tons of stamina or at least not as much, uh, excuse me, as strength or at least not as much strength as I needed when I lifted weights. So my body adapted and I weighed, I would, I would weigh about 185 to 190, but I would have a higher body fat percentage at that body weight. So, and so, and I was eating more. I was just, wasn't sending the muscle building signal. So if you, if you do this, you'll have a little bit of room, but not much. So I know who this is and she's a pro, uh, bikini competitor. So she's, and she's incredible con condition. And right away I, I scratched my head on why 
Um, you know, I, I know her, her, her goal, what she's trying to do. I see that she's off season or she's, or she's between shows. She's wanting to, you know, she's wanting to speed her metabolism up, uh, increase her caloric intake. Uh, but she also doesn't want to put on too much body fat, Mm -hmm. but I also see this and it's really common with my uh, female bikini competitors that have utilized cardio so much to get ready for shows mm. that they they fear letting it go completely and, yeah. and fear that they're going to mm-hmm. put too much body fat in. You're, you're going to be okay. You, uh, you if you you will maintain tightness mm. from building muscle. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you if you uh, increase your calories adequately and you don't overdo it, you just increase a little bit and you change up your programming. So you send a signal to the body to adapt and change. You you'll add muscle. You won't add body fat. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and then what I would do is as you're in the and we talked about this the other day is as you're in this caloric surplus. Uh, if you feel like you've been in a surplus for too many days or too many weeks in a row, throw some intermittent fasting days in there to kind of reset and drop your calories back down. But would highly recommend. Uh, winging yourself off of cardio completely and focusing more on your neat, just getting steps and being active uh, to keep maybe the calorie burn up there, but not stressing the body and sitting the, the cardio signal because it's, you know, no matter how you draw this up, if your goal is to speed your metabolism up, build muscle and and not put body fat on, then putting cardio in there uh, is going to be really challenging to try and do both, and and I and I've seen your your Instagram before. I've got an incredible physique already. You're already even in your your worst shape. I still think you look great. So uh, I, I think part of this is probably that fear that I know a lot of my competitors mm-hmm. get. Uh, you're so used to seeing yourself shredded and lean. Like, don't be afraid to uh, put a little bit of body fat on. It don't worry, it'll come right back off. And the the benefits of this, and this is what I used to try and teach my competitors is. You know, the, the body is this adaptation machine. And so if you always are doing cardio and you're doing cardio even in the off season and and then you go into season and it's time to start cutting for a show and then you want to ramp up the cardio, your body will be rest, less responsive than it would be if you mm-hmm. had l- limited your cardio or got rid of your cardio, cardio completely and then reintroduced it come prep time. This is why when I coach bikini competitors, I, the first, you know, four to six weeks of our show prep is no cardio. It's all through just walking steps because as a coach, I know that I want them the final four four weeks or so, I want to be able to say, okay, now I want you to do cardio every day. And I know that if I if restrict if I've restricted her doing cardio during the off season and during the first few weeks of prep, that I know that if I start to introduce cardio, that her body will start responding right away. And now we're talking all about aesthetics right now. This is not somebody trying to build cardio endurance or get ready for a sport, or we're not talking about overall health. When we're talking purely for aesthetic purposes, you know, you want to use cardio as a, as a tool and a last resource to really keep progressing as the weeks go into your prep. Yeah. And sometimes look, you can even just, you know, you, you kind of mentioned this a little bit, Adam, you can even just not raise calories and just start cutting cardio down. Right. So it's 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 kind of the same thing or similar, I should say, in the sense that you're changing the energy balance um, in favor of potentially speeding up your metabolism. So what you could also do is eat the same amount, and I'm, I'm assuming you're lifting weights because you're a, a high-level competitor. Keep lifting weights, just start cutting ca- cardio down and keep calories the same. And so in essence, it's like you've increased your, your calories. Um, and what you what you'll find is as you cut the the cardio down, your strength may or should start going up in your regular weight training workouts. Um, and then once you get accustomed to that, then you can slowly bump up from there as well. And a staggered approach, I think, is probably the best approach. I mean, what may help is not. I, I definitely don't think you should do everything all at once. So let's say you're doing. Look at your total time doing cardio. Cut it down by a quarter. And then wait a couple weeks, and then cut it down by another quarter. Wait a couple weeks, and then cut it down again by another quarter. So at the end of, you know, six weeks or whatever, you're down to maybe no cardio, but you're eating the same amount of calories, and you should be getting stronger. And then slowly, you know, bump it up. Uh, but I guess the, the, you know, what we're kind of going over and explaining is this: the long way of saying, yes, you can speed up your metabolism just by eating more, but uh, that alone isn't going to give you much room to to go very far. If you don't combine it with good weight training, 
um, then it's not going to do a whole lot. And so I think what Adam was saying is is your best your best bet: reduce and then eliminate cardio, um, increase your NEAT or ma- monitor your NEAT, lift heavy weights, and then slowly bump your calories. Next question is from Evan Brandenburg. How do you train your ability to recover and increase work capacity? Why is this important? Oh, yeah. You can definitely train your body's ability to recover and increase your work capacity. Didn't Justin do a YouTube series on this? Did you? Yeah, building the, your work capacity. Yeah, didn't yeah. you do a series on the channel? Yeah, and there was just ways that uh, incorporated certain things like, um, you, you know, building your work capacity through like farmer carries and, and like more functional, like moving type exercises that I added load to uh, that, that also was, I mean, it, it was more of like grinding type work. So uh, in, in terms of like adding those in were, they had a cardio feel to it, but you you had weights that you're carrying with you. So uh, yeah, we did a whole YouTube series on that to, in order to build and increase that work capacity. Yeah. I mean, aside, okay. So aside from having a good diet, good sleep and all the stuff that affects your body ability to recover, just give yourself time and slowly increase your volume and frequency of training over time. I have found for me, what gets my work capacity or my body's ability to recover faster is not increasing the, the, the daily volume or increasing the intensity, but rather increasing the frequency of my workouts. That really gets my work capacity through the roof. Yeah. So rather than making, let's say I'm working out four days a week, rather than making my four day a week workouts longer, I'll throw in another day of working out that would maybe uh, you know accomplish the extra time that I'd get from the longer four workouts and then add another day. And I learned this as a kid, I remember going to work with my dad over the summer one year. We were, uh, I was, I think I was, I want to say 15. Um, so I'm a teenager. I've been working out for a year. I think I'm pretty, you know, tough or whatever. And my grandfather from Sicily was visiting and he came for the summer and he would not like take a real vacation. He's like, no, I'm going to go to work with, with my son. So my grandfather came to work with my dad and me and we were out mixing cement. And here's this 67 year old man um mixing cement and whistling Mm -hmm. doing it the whole time and i I mean it's hot it was like it was summertime so it's like 90 degrees outside i'm 15 my hands are getting blistered i'm tired and my grandfather's whistling and singing and mixing cement and carrying the cement up and down and that's when i realized like you could definitely there's an incredible capacity that the body has for work and the thing is my grandfather been doing it since he was a kid he just slowly built that ability and you can do that with your training. You just have to be consistent yeah. and slowly increase your, your body's ability to be able to handle that shit. A lot of that has to do with technique, too. And you refine the technique by practicing the movements constantly. And so to add an increased volume, obviously, that's a way to kind of build up that that stamina and, and endurance and ability to withstand that, that excess of, of load and the volume of it. But to be able to go through those movements and refine the process of that, uh, it really helps, you know, you to be able to get through and, and build more work on top of that. So, uh, like if you, if you see how like these construction workers, they lay everything out and they have a specific technique of how they hold, uh, you know, a nail and then they hit it with one strike and there's just like, there's a process to, in a refinement process all the way across the board. Even with training, if I was to hone in better with how I squat with that, how I bench with how I do all these like major lifts, um, you know, I'm going to maximize my efficiency, uh, which then I can then add more volume to. Well, that. I think it's important too, that we define what work capacity means, because I, I think for some people, it means I can work out really hard and really long for one big workout. That's not what I'm talking about. When I'm talking about work capacity, I'm talking about the, the ability to work out hard every day or the, the, to be able to do it frequently over time. Because like, like I said, I would go to work with my dad and I'd be fine one day. I'd work hard just like everybody else. Then I'd be kind of sore the day after. And then the day after that, I'd be even more sore. And these guys aren't even sore and they're, they're continuing to work. That's, that's work capacity. And for me, increasing the frequency of my workouts did that better than making my than just making my current workouts longer and harder. Right. I learned that with MAPS Anabolic. With MAPS Anabolic, that's when I really started switching to full body workouts and then trigger sessions, which are short workouts several times a day on the off days. And I, re- I realized that if I kind of slowly ramped this up, I had this incredible ability to just work out more and more and more and more and not feel bad about it and feel okay. My body wasn't breaking down. I wasn't getting super sore. 
Um, frequency. Frequency mm-hmm. of training is probably the best way to do this rather than beating the crap out of yourself in just one day. Lower the intensity, train more frequently, and then little by little you're able to work out well, harder. Well, that's, I mean, the examples like these kids that grew up on a farm and, and – we we recognize that right away on the football team and like I, I've even heard like Navy SEALs have talked about too like who really makes it through these like uh, buds training and, and these crazy like uh, highly intense uh, situations and it's because it they started young and it just was a process of like overcoming this constant everyday um, stress and, and moving heavy objects and that was just a it became uh, something that was like a daily occurrence and these these kids were just like freakishly strong because they could just withstand uh, you know whatever you threw at them absolutely so are you mixing cement in the a wheelbarrow how are you doing it no so it would be a big tub like the big you know it's made out of like plastic and it's huge it's like from where you're at to where Justin's at oh wow and you would you would add the you know the sand the the, the cement the lime if you're making mud or whatever and typically you'd have one guy on one side and one guy on the other side and you I still one guy mixes it and then the other guy mixes it and you go back and forth and then you add water and then you keep going back and forth <laughs> oh, yeah, you I, do, I, you, you I still remember the, the technique dude I still yeah. remember the scoop and oh yeah and, with and the big rake thing. yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You lift it up and turn it so you get all the yeah. dry oh, no, dude. on the surface. I was on one side. My grandfather's on the other side. It's fucking. Sw- I'll never forget. It's this. grueling. It was sweltering hot, and I wanted to look. I wanted to show off to my grandfather, like I'm, I can work hard, you know. Yeah. And so I'm on one end. He's on the other end, and we're mixing. And every time one guy's done mixing, you pass the, the you know the shovel or the hoe over to the other guy, and he keeps going. And we're doing this back and forth, back and pass forth, off back. That hoe. And I'm watching. And there's a there's a jug of, of there's a cooler of water. Like five feet to the left yeah, in the who shade. Who gets it first? And yeah. I'm looking at it like, oh my god! I don't... And my grandfather just keeps going, and he's whistling, and he's going faster than I am, so I'm not getting any rest. Yeah. And we're going back and forth, and I'm like, and then when we we, we put it in buckets and bring it up the stairs to my dad, we come back down. I think he's gonna take a break. Nope, goes right back to him. And that's when I realized, like, okay, there's a whole other gear. That <laughs> there's never, another one. They don't have that. That yet. I haven't developed. <laughs> yeah. But, but it's frequency, man, because by the end of the summer, I was always like my work capacity had gone up. It's not about super long, super hard, intense workouts. It's about doing them frequently and then slowly building up your tolerance to that. Yeah, absolutely. Next question is from FM Miracle Homes. What are your essentials for a home gym? Well, you both have the home gyms. Yeah. Yeah. I I love having a rack. I mean, I don't really know. Yeah. It's, isn't it impressive, you guys? Yeah. <laughs> I built it myself. I was 13 there for yeah, a second. I know. <laughs> Total setup. Oops. Uh, but just having that in, in a bar, because I'm... I mean, I have to have a barbell. That's just, I mean, I can't really have that effective of work. I've tried before with kettlebells and dumbbells, and I just don't, I don't get the same type of response I do with the barbell. I need to, and I can intermittently kind of switch. And so I could switch to dumbbell training, kettlebell training, but I always have to come back to barbell loaded training. So for me, it's essential having a rack because I also want to be able to set up for a squat for an overhead press. Uh, for a bench press. Um, and you know, that's, that's crucial for me. So between that and dumbbells, um, kettlebells, I actually have, um, I have this, this hook that goes over one of my doors. So I actually, it, it has like kind of a makeshift way of, of applying cable type exercises for accessory work and mm-hmm. things like that, which is nice, but rubber bands are fine for that. So no, that's for, about it for, for me, for the first uh, maybe two years of my lifting when I was a kid. And then for the last, um, it, b- besides when I go to gyms and work out, which is not often, n- I'd say 90% of my workouts over the last 14 years have been done with a rack, a barbell, dumbbells, and an adjustable bench. That's been 90% of my workouts for the last 14 years. And there was a huge stretch there where that's all I did. Where yeah. When I had my personal training studio, uh, I, I, that's what I had. I had cables in there too. And I'd use those occasionally, but it was all barbells, dumbbells, adjustable bench in Iraq. 14 and, years like that, huh? Yeah. And I, I'll tell you, that's all bodybuilders had for a long time. And that's, I mean, I'm not gonna lie. Now you gotta get creative, um, you know, with your exercises, but I could, I could write down a thousand exercises that I can do with all of those, uh, with just those, those tools right there. That's really all you need. I could train anybody with that. Now, machines and stuff, they're great variety. 
Um, they can be a lot of fun. They can add a lot of volume uh, to your workouts with, with more of that variety and less of that damage. But uh-uh, D- dumbbells, barbell, a rack, and adjustable bench. And I've got you 100% covered. I could hit every body part, do every functional movement I want. I can work with almost anybody. That's how I train clients forever. Mm-hmm. And that's still how I prefer to do, a, to do most of my workouts. It's all the best exercises. Now, now when I go to the gym today... I do all machine workouts. And the only reason why I do that is I never do them. Yeah. So it's like- It's I, novelty. I, yeah. It's just, oh, I'm going to the gym today, so I might as well use all the equipment that I never use. But no, 90% more. And that's it. That's, and that's what I recommend for anybody. And here's a cool thing. It's not that expensive. I was just going to say, what do, you think the, what do you think the cost is for that your setups? Oh. Mm, you yeah, know what yours probably was? Probably around 2500 at the end of the day. A couple grand. Yeah. If you go on Craigslist and you're smart and you get used stuff, you can do it even cheaper. I don't. I like the new stuff. You know, I right. like to have it nice and new. We had some people in our forum like build racks and shit. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, yep. Yeah. yeah. There's some people that can really like uh, be, you know, ingenuitive about it. Yeah. Yeah. And the, and the, the value of it having at home is obviously the, the is scheduling. What? <laughs> ingenuitive. Ingenuitive. Uh, wow. I don't know. <laughs> I was just trying to check yeah. myself that's, there. That's, that's like an Adam word right there. <laughs> yeah, I just made it one should, up. No, that's up there with electronical. It should it's, be a word. It though. should, it should be. be. It sounds like it should be. I know exactly I know, what though. you I mean. I want somebody yeah. fact check me on that. No, it's like, like innovative. Maybe. Like, yeah, like you look innovative. At, Thank you, Doug. Yeah, there's like all these exercises um, with barbells and dumbbells that a lot of people haven't done or don't do anymore because of machines. Like a barbell hack squat. What a great exercise. Um, you know, T bar row with the bar jammed into the corner of the wall. Great exercise for for the back. Um, there's lots of, lots of shoulder variations on the bench. There's a incline bench lateral for the for the shoulders that you don't ever see anybody doing. There's spider curls and sissy squats and all these different variations of exercises that are done with free weights that I kind of grew up on that I think uh, are the most effective movements um, that exist. That really are. So I mean, on a, if you guys. Only had to pick four pieces of equipment. Don't tell me you would disagree, right? Exact same no, thing. Yeah. yeah. Aren't you thinking about doing some home gym stuff? Eh, we'll see. It all depends on what ha- what do I do with my Camaro because I, I need that for that that spot for my Camaro. If I didn't have that there, I 100 percent would have the PRX set up by Justin. Yeah. But I have like I have right now at the house. I have the rower. I have a set of dumbbells and I have a couple kettlebells. Um, I was doing work in the garage yesterday. For me, I'm still, I don't know. And I don't know if it's just the, I like all the toys in the gym. You know, I like all the cables, the machines, and to be able to integrate that into my workout. Although I'll tell you what, I since I started hanging out with you guys, I've done more just straight traditional barbell lifting uh, in my life, more in my life in the last five years in total combined mm-hmm. for sure, just in the last five It's so years. funny because I can see the, like I get excited going to a gym with a lot of equipment because I get to try different things. But I can get even more excited knowing I'm about to do a hard workout and I just have four like you know dumbbells and a barbell. Like okay, this yeah. is gonna get you know this is gonna get crazy. This is gonna get heavy. Well, simplicity for me it helps. I don't know. It just helps me to to get through the the workout. Like I'm I just like to focus on one thing at a time. Sometimes when I'm at the gym, it's just so much cool shit that I'm like I get like distracted. Weren't we just talking to somebody about that? Like when we have too much of stuff. Like it, it's too uh, many choices. It's like the uh, I don't know if anybody did this, but like I remember as a kid, I you know yeah, date myself here, collecting video cassettes. You know, and as a kid who didn't make very much money in school and stuff like that, like, you know, once a month, maybe I could buy one video cassette. So I had like 30 video cassettes. I watched those 30 movies over like 100 times. Yeah. Yeah. Later on in my life when, you know, spending $15 on a DVD was no big deal. So that I had hundreds. And I remember my you've seen my collection that I got rid of not that long ago. And I remember standing in front of that for hours, not yeah. fucking knowing what to it's like watch. Netflix. It's like mind boggling. Yeah, yeah like, oh, mid, like I, I got nothing good to watch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But when I was a kid, and all I had was the the twenty or thirty video cassettes, I watched them all like thirty to four times, and it was a great experience. But yeah. having too much uh, options sometimes. Is yeah, not here's the some best. other things that I would say you'd want for your home. Uh, you make yourself a, a calf block because obviously barbell dumbbells. Uh, you know, you want to be able to do calf raises. Um, I used to like to have an ab roller, which is the wheel with the little thing for intense mm. ab exercises. A physio ball is always great for a home gym. A floor mat that uh, you can lay on. Yeah, in terms of the floor mat, so uh, they have horse 
um, grade like floor mats that are like thick, but because you get it for like horse stalls, it's cheaper. That's than, where I got mine. Yeah. And then instead of getting, cause it's outrageous. A lot of these that if you're looking for fitness specific products, uh, they hike the price up like crazy. Mm -hmm. So if, if it's something like that, that you could get, uh, that's already, you know, people use for horse stalls. Yep. That's Craig, way to go. Our buddy Craig Caperso built an awesome at home. He too. did. I don't know if you've seen his latest. I mean, it's completely outfitted now. Oh so. no, it's great. Yeah. It's great. But you, in, Oh, the other thing I like to do is I like to get a, a few bumper plates because of putting down metal plates on the floor, even if I have yeah, a rubber. Concrete. Yeah, yeah so I have plates. a couple bumper plates, and I got these bumper plates that are just a tad bit larger than my metal plates, so I could put one bumper plate on, the rest are metal plates, and then mm -hmm. it's the bumper plate that absorbs most of the, the shock. Next question is from Cute Kells 6 Is lifting heavy a bad idea after getting a deep tissue massage? Okay, so uh, so here's the it thing. It can be. Oh yeah, look, yeah, it, it can be. Remember, this is how a massage works on the body: deep tissue. When they're in there hammering muscles out, um, a lot of what's happening, if not all of that's happening, is it's sending a signal to your central nervous system to relax those muscles. And so, when you feel a knot in your muscles or they feel tight, that's your that's your CNS sending kind of this low level signal, telling that muscle to be slightly tight or tensed. When you press on it really, really hard, the CNS gets the signal and tells it to relax to prevent damage from happening. Before a workout, you probably don't want a massive CNS dampening signal. It would be like doing a deep, it would be like doing static stretches before lifting. Probably not a good idea. You're loose, you're like Gumby. And I bet you if they did a study on this, and I'm speaking generally because I could see how this could benefit certain individuals. Like, let's say you're somebody who's just got ultra tight traps. Probably a good idea to have deep tissue work on your traps before you do back work so your traps don't take over. But generally speaking, I bet you if they did a study on this, like deep, deep, deep tissue massage and then right after heavy lifting, I bet you'd see injury rates go up a little bit, just like you would with static stretching. Deep tissue massage before the heavy and then heavy. Right. Okay, yeah. yeah. I it's great after. After is the best. That's mm -hmm. what you you ideally you want to go. I mean you you just and you it's funny because people tend to go get the deep tissue like after the soreness sets in two 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 days later or whatever, but the best time to do a deep tissue is is following a a really hard lifting session, not before. It's not as advantageous to do it beforehand, and especially if they've done some. I mean, if they got really in on you. Sometimes they'll have they've done enough damage that your body's trying to re repair itself because they've gotten in on you so bad, and then to be going into the gym and hammering it, not ideal at all. But post uh, hard session, incredible, yeah, incredible well, benefits. I remember I got tripped out on the first like legit deep tissue massage. Um, this. Uh, How, young, I've been sore, man. Oh, after dude, doing that. This oh, yeah. Young lady that used to rent uh, the office in my well in the back of my wellness studio. She was the best massage therapist I've ever worked with, um, and she introduced me to what like deep tissue really was. And I remember at the time I was doing jujitsu and I had really bad uh, tennis elbow on, on both sides of, of my arm. They were just always constantly sore, and I couldn't figure out what it was. And I would stretch and stuff and. She said, let me do a two-hour session on your forearms. So I said, okay, two hours. Like, all right. And she beat the shit out of my forearms. But I'll never forget, hey. they were pumped. Yeah. I had a pump in them as if I worked them out because she had worked on them so bad. And then the pain was gone. I was sore for a couple of days afterwards, and it completely solved uh, the problem. So a legit, but a legit dip, deep tissue massage. I mean, how do you feel, Adam, after getting one of those? Oh yeah, no, it's, I'm exhausted afterwards. I, you, uh, a, a lot of times, like Justin said, I'm sore. It's rare that I'm not a little bit sore. Like it's pretty common that if yeah. you get a really deep tissue massage, but man, it, it promotes like, all the blood flow, oxygen and nutrients to get into those muscles and recover. So, you know, what's better than to go. I love, I used to love getting a hard, heavy leg training session in and then get deep Dude, tissue work into my, yeah, yeah, into my legs. Oh man, Phil. It but really after would, that, I like to do more mobility and flow to, you know, just get everything circulated and moving properly again. It know. really, it really mitigates how sore you are. Like we, and we know this, like one of the worst things that you can do is do a hard training session and then like hop on a plane or go lay oh, down, oh, yeah. right? Or go lay down and be lazy the next day, be seated all day long, right? Then you just seize up and you lock up. Um, if you get a deep tissue massage afterwards, it'll really mitigate that, that mm -hmm. tightness that you normally feel the next two days from a hard lifting session, but definitely not ideal to do it and then go into no, it. No, and now there are some cases where a deep tissue massage, if 
uh, if targeted and on the right person, is a good thing before heavy lifting. But right, it's, but it's targeted. Right. If you, for example, and I'll give you an example of that. And I've had this before. Like if you had like one of your shoulders is 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 locked in and rolled forward, like just on one side, and they go in and they open up you know, the whole scapula. To promote better right. movement. Yeah, to promote better movement. And then I go in to go do a, a heavy chest day. Like, that makes sense. It makes sense because I'm so locked up. I'm in this rounded position. Going to go do a heavy session before fixing that would be would be problematic. So this is what I did in, mm-hmm. my, in my wellness studio, and we were so successful at it. And what I would do is I would get a client. I would do an assessment. I'd identify, you know, imbalances and tight muscles and whatever. Mm-hmm. Then I'd have my massage therapist do her assessment, and she would do a different assessment. She would watch them walk and stand, and then she would place her hands on them. And she said she could tell by the pliability of the muscle, that is, she would push on the muscle and see how, I guess, how pliable it is, right? How much it moves and the person's response in terms of, you know, where they're tight and, you know, where they need work. And then based off of that, I would have them see her before I train them, and I would tell her what I'm going to do that day. I'm going to say, okay, so John, I'm going to do squats with him. And so I want you to help, you know, help him get into the squatting positions better. So then she would take squat him in the back and we obviously, we would share files. So we used to have files that we share so we could see what we would do and whatever. And she would, let's say he had, you know, uh, forward shoulder really, really bad. And it was hard for him to grab the bar and squeeze back. She would do deep tissue across his chest and shoulders, which would loosen those up and allow him to squeeze in the back. Maybe he has calves or soleus muscles that are so tight that his heels want to come off the floor. Mm-hmm. Then she's going to do deep tissue. on. So basically her job was to get the tight muscles out of the way so that I could do my job right, that makes sense. as a trainer. And right. let me tell you, that now that's very specific. That's why I don't recommend go get a deep mis- tissue massage and lift heavy. You have they have to know what they're doing. But if they do it right, we worked fucking miracles. We used to correct. I would correct muscle imbalances and in, 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 with with that combination fast. It would like it was like one third the time. Normally it would take me let's say two or three months to get someone to fix a problem. Oh yeah, because ideally, just, I mean, you're trying to teach them how to self apply. You know the you know and massage those specific muscles in order to unlock in abilities for them to move it properly uh, and that's why you kind of like some of these other tools like you know the foam roller and uh using these vibrating tools like do help initially just to get you to uh you know dampen that that strong like tight cns signal to uh you know protect and restrict the movement uh, to be able to kind of allow then into the workout. Now we have more range of motion and ability to get through proper movement, but you know, inevitably it's, it was a constant battle, you know, Mm -hmm. to be able to stimulate that, but then like keep recreating good movement patterns. So it has to keep happening constantly. Yeah, No, my, and I learned from it. So because I worked with this young lady and she would do this, I started picking up on some of the stuff and then simple stuff I would do myself. Like a, a real easy example is, a lot of people uh, have a tendency when they do back exercises like a row, they have a tendency to shrug their shoulders. And this is just because they have typically weak mid-back muscles um, and their upper traps are just taking over all the time. And these are people who have stiff necks and tension headaches. And so I would have them do a row. I would see that, oh, when I tell them to really squeeze hard back, they, they shrug their shoulder, their traps are tight. In between sets, I would do deep tissue massage on their traps. Mm-hmm. And all I was doing was temporarily weakening the traps. I was getting their traps to relax. And then lo and behold, we'd get better form. And then that form would then strengthen the, the better recruitment patterns. Um, but that being said, unless you have somebody that really knows what they're doing and they know what you're working I know I don't know very many massage therapists that know exercise very well. Mm. That's the problem. So, And what I mean by that is they know exercise but not like a trainer. So I worked with a therapist. Unless you have someone that knows exercise yeah, and knows what you're about to do, a sports therapist should should know their shit. Exactly. Yeah, a sports therapist should be able. You should yeah. be able to go in. I mean, I used to be able to go see a sports therapist and tell them what's going on with me, and then they know where they need to be working. So a good one will know what to do. But if you're just going to get a nice, relaxing, deep tissue massage, and you're there, and you want to work out right after. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you're better off not going in training right afterwards. You're better off the the training beforehand, and then just get a. If you're going to do like a full body deep tissue, and you're not you know, focusing on specific areas like you guys are talking about. Totally. If you go to mindpumpfree.com, you can download our guides. They're all absolutely free. You can also find us all on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin. You can find me at Mind Pump Sal and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. 
If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump. <laughs>